Hello, everybody. Welcome to back to our first official lecture for Urban Studies 114, Sex and the City. I'm Professor Andres Bernal. And before we get started, I wanted to say a quick word about these readings and, and the different kinds of readings that we'll be having all semester. Um, you know, conceptually, some of these can be uh, a bit difficult, um, especially at the undergraduate level. But, um, you know, it is my job to make sure that I unpack uh, many of the concepts and the themes in many of these readings. So if you're going through the different chapters or articles and you don't understand something, that's totally fine. Don't freak out. Um, you can write it down um, so you could ask me a question or uh, you can go back to it later. You can slow down your reading, whatever um, you think will work for you. The important thing is that I'm going to clear up and expand on everything that's going to be important and there's nothing that I'm going to test you all on that I have not specifically covered and addressed. So, with that said, let's get started. All right, there were four assignments, two videos, and two chapters. Um, and I'm really going to focus on the chapters here. Um, the videos are really mostly to help you all understand some of these concepts. So the first one we'll start with is of course the introduction from Space, Place, and Sex by Linda Johnson and Robert, Robin Longhurst, uh, the preface and the introduction, and the first kind of themes that I want to explore that kind of set the stage for everything else is the one, the idea of the body and geography. And the chapter starts off with these two examples with these two stories in the media in Australia and New Zealand about certain uh, places that uh, basically kicked people out or didn't let people enter, didn't let certain kinds of bodies enter a place for different reasons. And that kind of sets this theme that the body has a very particular relationship to space itself. <clears throat> and how we organize and negotiate that um, happens through all of these different processes that we're going to be talking about. So the body and geography, I mean, geography, we usually think of maps of countries and things like that. And surely that's very, very important. However, geography extends beyond that. And really, it's about our uh, kind of practice of naming and identifying and defining space itself in different ways, at different scales, and for different purposes. Because by doing that is the way that we uh, know how to move in the world. Otherwise, we'd all be lost and wouldn't really we'd just be zombies, uh, right? So geography is this practice of naming and identifying in different kinds of ways the built and natural environment around us. And the body is itself uh, something that has a relationship to the built environment and the world around us. <coughs> I want to give, I gave you all a quote here that I thought was really interesting by Dr. Kate Balistreri. Uh, she's a, a kind of a sex therapist, and she said, as I studied the human condition, it became clear to me that people's relationship to sex was even more compelling than sex itself. Uh, so that's kind of pointing to what we're looking at in, in this class, which is that there is no neutral kind of independent sex itself, but rather it, it, it's about a relationship. Um, that comes to be in different ways. Um, so the body, which is going to be a key concept in all of this, right, our physical body and all the different parts about it and the way that we understand it, the way that others understand it, is itself a contested site engaged in mutually constituted power relations in different places and at different times. Now, what the hell does that mean? What this means is that our understanding of the body, like in the examples where uh, somebody was kicked out of a casino because uh, the, this woman's breasts were too large and that was viewed as obscene, you know, that is a site of power relations that determine, you know, this person can't exist here. This body is not allowed here. Um, and similarly with the other story as well, certain a certain community viewed... Uh, uh, you know, heterosexuals having bachelor and bachelorette parties as a threat to the LGBTQ community in a specific 
um, part of the world and a specific neighborhood or community. And so they said, you know, for our safety, because there's been such a long history of violence against certain people, uh, we will not allow, um, you know, certain kinds of parties and certain kinds of people to exist. So two totally different examples, but both signify the point that we're talking about here, and that's that the body itself is understood in different ways, does different things, and it's part of, it can't be independent, it's constituted mutually in all of these different power relations that are connected to geographies or places and change and can change across times. So uh, the introduction, geography, body, sex, and gender um, makes the point that sexuality is constantly being mapped and remapped across cultural and social landscapes. So, you know, as I mentioned, geography is about mapping and defining and describing and navigating, um, not just, you know, somebody on a boat, but rather the world itself in all different kinds of ways that we can all imagine. And so sexuality, um, you know, our identity, what we desire, what we want, what turns us on, what kind of repulses us, how we understand ourselves, where we can move, where we can't move, how we can move. This is constantly being mapped and remapped um, in, in, in many different ways across any society or any kind of social landscape. So the body is both mobile and it's channeled, it's fixed and it's fluid. And this is kind of this interesting relationship between um, the body is something that can change, can move, can evolve, can be questioned, can be, you know, uh, can be tattooed, can be, you know, can grow, all of these different kinds of things. But at the same time, it, it, it is embodied, in, it's in a fixed place, um, and it can move, um, but it also channels all kinds of different meanings um, in different ways, and that's very important. So the body is constitutively linked and cannot be decoupled from, can't be separated from, sex, space, and place. Um, we, are, we are part of this holistic experience where our bodies um, have a connection to sex in all of its different meanings and space and place, which is kind of two concepts we'll explore a little bit more in detail that, of course, have to do with this broader idea of geography and the physical, spatial, um, temporal world itself. Bodies become sexual and sexualized. And this is beginning to touch on the notion of a social construct. And, of course, I gave you all a short video to think about and learn about what social constructs are. And essentially, again, what this means is that there isn't a neutral, objective, kind of just thing to be discovered called the body that has nothing to do with our minds and language and meaning, but rather bodies become sexual and sexualized. Um, we determine and we name and describe and we afford characteristics to bodies um, that we call sexual and that we sexualize in different ways. And this is a social process that has to do with social practices. Um, and that's how uh, we relate to one another and we create culture and society. All right. So, Thinking about that, thinking about social constructs and how the body and, and, and is, is something that becomes sexualized and sexual and becomes a lot of different things, right? Then the other big important concept that we're going to compare to the body or that the body exists within, that many bodies exist within, is the concept of scale. So what is scale? I mean, typically, like on a map, we think of scale as a representation or a ratio of size, of degree, um, but scale can exist on, on you know, many different forms and formats. And really, it describes or talks about um, the fact that there are levels. There are levels in, uh, of how we can organize our understanding of the world, right? It's, it's not just all a big mess. We can determine, oh, you know, this is a house. This is a neighborhood. This is a street, right? This is a city. This is a country. All of these are words um, that describe different scales, different levels of breadth uh, of space and of culture and of politics that we define and name and we uh, att give attributes to, right? 
So the social construction of scale, or this process that determines different scales of, of social reality, is a political process. Um, it's a political process um, that, and I think I repeated that on the uh, slides on accident, but, you know, that's cool. Uh, it's a political process because this is not something that um, is, you know, it's, it's again, it's kind of this, all of this is pushing back against the notion that things just exist and they're natural, right? This political process has to do with determining, you know, how we organize the world, who gets what, um, how that process works, how you participate in society, how rights are distributed, how different inequalities are dealt with, why inequalities exist. All of these things are political processes, right? And that can look at different things from a protest to voting, um, to just the everyday reproduction of the world and the status quo. All of these things are political processes, right? So <clears throat> there is a social construction of scale through, a, through many different political processes. And the city is a category of scale itself. And of course, urban studies and this class, Sex and the City, um, will use the city as a scale and a concept that we're going to look at and spend some time prioritizing, okay? So the production of scale is implicated in the projection of space. What does that mean, right? So when we produce scale, when we produce a city, we project space in different, and we use space and manipulate space but also we afford characteristics to space in different kinds of ways. What do I mean by that? Well, when we create scale, we have to think of ways of measurement. So we think of, okay, miles, street corners, um, blocks, all of these, the, these different um, evaluative metrics are things that we've made up to kind of organize and keep track of scale. Uh, and so we use these things, right? And then we can call something like city limits. Um, we can create a border. We can create, um, you know, a sign at the, at, a, at the kind of end of a border to signify that you are now entering another city. Um, this is all the projection of space. We are projecting meaning onto space to move it and manipulate it in a certain kind of way, to produce it and reproduce it in a certain kind of way. And in doing so, space produces us. Space is not a neutral background. Uh, scale is not a neutral backdrop, a stage that we just passively engage in, like two forces coming together. No, it's all part of one process. It scale produces us and we produce scale. That's the idea behind uh, this concept, right? So, you know, take a moment and think about that. Take a moment and think about the different experiences you've had with various scales and the back and forth mutually constitutive um, phenomenon that that has meant for perhaps your life and your identities and the way you have evolved and learned about yourself and others. Scale is overlapping and nested, okay, connected to mobility. We move across scale. Sometimes we need technologies and other uh, spaces to move across scale like, like cars, like trains or airplanes or boats that moves us to different kinds of scales that are nested, right? So we got, you know, we call things a country and a region or a city and a neighbor, right? These are all different kinds of scales that are organized in different kinds of ways. And access and control over mobility has a big role in how we experience scale and place itself. Uh, scales can be used to define, to dominate, and to control if you um, are not allowed to enter a certain kind of place or are unsafe at a certain scale, that is a form of perhaps domination and control. If you're a child and you don't have access to your parents or a car, you may be confined to a, uh, a home or maybe a, somebody is experiencing an abusive, abusive domestic relationship and they're not allowed to leave their partner. They may be dominated and controlled and defined, confined into a particular scale. But scale can also be protective and empowering. When the slaves were freed in the United States after the Civil War, many people mobilized and migrated to the North to leave a certain level of scale that was hostile and deeply dangerous to people. At the same time, communities can be constructed where people feel safe um, in situations where they were not safe 
otherwise. So scale can protect, it can empower, but it can also dominate and oppress. And it is nested and always overlapping. All of this talk about social constructions, about meaning, about um, processes and social practices that produce the world and our bodies, give meaning to our bodies and produce scale itself, the city, the country, the neighborhood, the household, whatever, right? What's the key, uh, uh, the, the key category here, the key uh, factor in all of this? Well, it's language. And uh, in a lot of this kind of work in, in um, kind of a sociological and philosophical approach to sex and sexuality and bodies, um, language plays a central role. Sometimes this is called qualitative research methods. Quantitative research methods usually involves numbers and statistics and trying to have kind of hard data about things to draw conclusions. But qualitative met methods is studying the way the social world and culture is created through language itself. So language creates reality and gives meaning to the world. Without language, we wouldn't be humans and uh, you know we would just kind of be floating in, in incoherence. We need language to be coherent, to exist. Many would argue that probably language is what helped, uh, what, what determined the evolution of human beings. Um, and of course, communication looks differently for other animals, but um, we have a certain kind of language that's quite unique. Uh, so what does this mean? Meaning is constituted within language, but it's not the subject, not by the subject or the person that speaks it. So it's not individual, individuated people just creating reality with their thoughts and their minds separately, all in their own different kinds of worlds. Um, there is to a different degree, and this is why scale matters, right? At the scale of just your body, you may have a very unique perception and experience to things, and that's totally real and valuable. However, you are embedded in a wider context of other kinds of scales, and you didn't come up with the words and the ideas yourself, but rather those are learned over the rest of the world that we share with, right? So the point here is that this is all part of an interconnected whole uh, that we exist within, and language uh, is something that mediates that world and gives meaning to that world, not coming from individuals, but rather something that's learned collectively and shared and disseminated in different kinds of ways and at different scales. And this means that meaning can change, and it means that meaning and language is a site of politics. Just like the body is a site of contestation and politics, so is meaning and language. So again, it's this back and forth, like this interesting tension between uh, you know the kind of collective whole um, producing a certain kind of order through language, through meaning, and yet the ability for different people, different groups, or different individuals at different levels to challenge and to uh, come up with new ways of thinking about things and push back. And, and these things aren't separated from one another. In fact, they're all overlapping. Um, in different kinds of ways. And that is what is, is important here, right? The body, how is the body a site of politics and contestation? Because meaning and language is what gives coherence to the body. Uh, you know, I'll give you some examples, right? Working out, being healthy, having a good sex life, losing your virginity, keeping your virginity, deciding when and when you don't want to have sex, how to um, have partnerships or your dating life. These are all questions that have to do with your understanding and relationship to your body as well as others. And what is the common factor? It's language that's giving sense, making sense. It's sense-making, right, to all of these things. So that's why language is important. Now, the meaning of the body, as I was just mentioning. So. Uh, a philosopher, maybe you've heard of him, Rene Descartes, he came up with this quote, I think, therefore I am. In doing so, he was trying to prove that he was real, and he ended up saying, I know I'm real because I can think, because I'm aware of myself. And that started this notion of the mind-body separation, right? That we have a mind, 
and then our body and the physical material world is kind of like a different type of thing. These things are separate. And that process itself, well, first of all, has been challenged since then by many, many people who kind of don't really uh, agree with that construction of the world, right? To say that there's a separation between mind and body. But the chapter argues that this process is itself a gendered dualism. What do I mean by gendered? Well, what that means is that uh, our understanding and our relationship to gender is shaped by this very historical moment where uh, there was a separation between mind and body. So, um, for example, at that time, the mind, reason, logic, rationality, thought, all of these things were qualities that were uh, ascribed to men and to men as being political, uh, authoritative, knowing how to govern, responsible for government and governance, intelligent, thoughtful, careful, rational, intel you know, all of these things, right? This was a male quality. And the body which was separated was considered an emotional, physical, other type of thing that we couldn't trust, that was outside of the power of our mind. And of course, the argument here is that that was gendered as female, uh, as women un being unable to control their emotions, being unable to think uh, in a rational way or be logical, and rather being much more um, imprisoned to their, their bodies, to pregnancy, um, to their physiology, and to nature itself. So sometimes to challenge this, the idea of the mind-body as one thing is used. Um, but this, is, this kind of starts this conversation already about the process of gender as a social construct and, of course, the difference between sex as male or female and the, the attributes, the qualities that, that the two of them possess as, um, you know, we, ha we, are, we are designated a, a sex when we are born by doctors through a certain process uh, of medicine that says, okay, ma males have this kind of body and do this and this is how they reproduce and females have this other kind, right? Well, uh, many thinkers and, and scholars and political activists and feminists were just were developed this other approach that was just like, well, wait a second. Uh, th these determinations about reproduction and our bodies and our organs can be, that's one thing, right? But how we learn and understand the proper role of our gender and of who we are as men and women, and what we're supposed to do, and our role in society, that's not biological. That's not something that's just a process. That's learned, that's social, and that has changed over time, right? The concept of sexuality is something that is a very modern idea, something you possess, I have a sexuality, right? What you like, um, and oftentimes the categories that were built around heterosexual, bisexual, pansexual, homosexual, right? These categories um, have been used uh, and they have evolved. We've have, we have more categories now than we had before. At one point, it was just normal people are heterosexual and then some people are homosexual and they're kind of, they're, they're, there's something wrong with them, right? You know, psychiatry used to classify homosexuality as a mental disorder. Uh, so... This is all learned and it's socially constructed and we decide and there's a political process that determines uh, all of these different kind of categorizations and they can be contested and that's kind of the idea here, both about gender, about sexuality, and um, this kind of mind-body separation is one example of how we reinforced the construction of gender along certain lines. So this notion of challenging uh, certain a certain status quo or a certain sense of normal, oftentimes described as what's queer or queering. Uh, there was a time where this word was used as a slur, but many many people in the LGBTQ plus community have kind of reclaimed it and used it as something that is subversive and challenging and basically means different. It is different from the standard, and it it is different from the standard in a good way, right? Uh, so here in the slide, I have this idea of the self and the other, 
again, part of like that separation of the mind and the body, good and evil, right? These binaries, as they're oftentimes called, uh, as if the world was just a simple black and white kind of formulation. And so the self, similar to the mind, has always been understood as like the normal thing and usually gendered as male and masculine. And the other, with a big capital, you know, big O, capitalized O, is kind of those that fall outside of the norm, the different, the weirdos, um, the things and the, mar- the, 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 the people that are marginalized and that don't seem to, you know, play by the rules or, uh, you know, just kind of demonstrate a sense of uh, normality, right? That's the other. And uh, historically, the other has faced tremendous discrimination and even violence. Another key idea, building upon the importance of language and social construction in all of this, is the notion of discourse. And what do we mean by discourse? Well, discourse is the structuring of knowledge and social practice through communicative language and media. Basically, you know, language is building the world collectively and at different scales, but discourse is how you structure all of that together into knowledge and social practice. What does that mean? Well, that means that language and information is not random. Some things we consider knowledge to know. We know things, right? So there's legitimacy given to certain forms of knowledge in certain contexts, power giving to that, right? Expertise. And this is put into practice, is the social, pra- we do things with knowledge and with information. We, we have to, we use it for the making sense of the world and the reproducing of the world, right? So communication, language, and media are uh, tools or avenues that communicate discourse or the structuring of knowledge and social practice, right? And there could be a discourse about masculinity and femininity. There could be a discourse about childhood. There could be a discourse about motherhood, a discourse about being divorced and or virginity, right? And these discourses organize people and organize bodies in different ways. They tell us what to do and they inform us about what's right and wrong and the expectations that we hold. Similarly, space and place is kind of an idea that ties all of this together. Space and place meaning that through bodies, socially constructed bodies and the socially constructed world uh, in political processes uh, at different scales, right, encounter spaces and places, okay? So spaces, you know, open fields, um, going outside to the subway, the subway system, a building, a plaza, a park. These are all different kinds of spaces that we have a relationship with, and we we give meaning to these things, and we experience them in certain kinds of ways: the grass, the the, the concrete, um, you know, a, a bridge, right? We go to the Brooklyn Bridge, and that is space that we are encountering, a built environment. But place, however, is kind of the utilization of discourse to make it a specific space. It's not not just any space. It's not just a bridge. It's the Williamsburg Bridge, right? And that's a place. And so we ascribe discourse, meaning knowledge, social practice, to the Williamsburg Bridge, to the Lexington Avenue stop, to Bryant Park, whatever, uh, to Yellowstone National Park, to the Atlantic Ocean, right? There is an association with it, and we have a specific cultural relationship where we have assumptions and expectations and and a a relationship with different spaces through the form of place, right? So we got these two concepts, space and place, built environment, physical world, right? We're encountering it. It's shaping us. We're shaping it. And we understand it in more specific ways, which is place, which is a particular kind of space. It's cultural, it's social, and it shapes us. It, again, determines how we can move in the world and how we can't and what to do with our bodies and tells us who we are, essentially, right? All right. So that kind of sums up that introduction from the first uh, book. Uh, Those are kind of the key concepts that lay the groundwork. Uh, And then we move on to Cities and Sexualities by Phil Hubbard, the introduction, 
And he starts this by laying out uh, certain goals that he has for the chapter, right? Understanding sexuality is simultaneously biological, psychological, and social. And we talked about this, right? Things, sexuality is not just your biology, although that is part of it, right? Our hormones, our reproductive system, our physiology, our organs, all these kinds of things, right? But those don't exist in a vacuum. They have to be understood psychologically through the many processes of our psychology. But all of that exists within a social context and is always socially determined. Language is involved, meaning is involved, politics is involved to determine how these things are understood and brought into being socially. Uh, the second goal is that, of course, place matters, and we've been talking about that, but in terms of a city, this has a big role in uh, how we experience cities, right? Places. And lastly, that there are processes that sexualize the city. So again, bodies become sexualized, and so do cities themselves. Sexual politics. Um, there is a right and wrong for sex through sexual politics. So as I mentioned before, virginity is experienced very different for a young woman and than for a young man in our typical society, right? As is being divorced, as is being a sexually promiscuous person, right? And there are consequences, different consequences for different people, gendered in different kinds of ways, right? So here there is a right and a wrong for sex. There is normal and there is abnormal, right? And how those boundaries are being drawn is the politics that we are interested in and how they coexist within different scales of space. Um, there are privileged sexualities that constitute a moral center. That means that these boundaries are being drawn and it tends to be, in our world today, continues to be mostly affirming that sex is dangerous and bad unless it's heteronormative. And what I mean by this is that there is a purpose to sex and everything outside of that purpose uh, is threatening in, in different kinds of ways. So the heteronormative purpose is, and this is important, right, that sex is meant to be for people to find partners, to get married and be in monogamous relationships and have a traditional nuclear family to reproduce. That is the idea. That is the purpose of sex. And things that fall outside of that um, start to get a little sketchy, right? That's the assumption. That's how boundaries are being drawn around the moral center. So obviously certain people, certain bodies are privileged and are empowered more than others under this notion. All right, urbanization, right? So how does this connect? How does this politics connect to urbanization? Well, in the 19th century, uh, modern cities were just rising very, very rapidly, and this involved many factors. People were migrating to certain places. The scale was turning into uh, the city itself. People were moving from mostly living in rural areas in the United States and many parts of the world to living in urban cities. And so people, right, scales changing, technology is changing, the aesthetics, our sensual experience, sight, hearing, artistic sensibilities, these things are being shaped and influenced by all of it, right? By the city, by all the people, by the scale, right? Ideology is changing um, in different kinds of ways in the modern world. The economy is changing, our relationship to work, being workers, being bosses, needing wages and money, um, being consumers. These things are changing and evolving. Uh, the city itself and the process of cities coming into being. And obviously all of this is affecting different spaces and places as was described. And this sexualizes the city. All of these things sexualize the city. How so? Well, we are meeting a lot more people, maybe people that we never encountered before, maybe types of people we never encountered before, discovering things about ourselves, perhaps. Uh, the scale of the city makes you more anonymous, uh, makes you have opportunities, physical opportunities from space to observe things maybe you didn't observe people maybe you never observed before. Uh, aesthetics, we're being stimulated creatively in ways that might be erotic, that might intrigue our sexual desire in different kinds of ways. Um, and then of course the economy is shaping our desire, our relationships in 
with different ways as well. So all of this is contributing both to the rise of cities and to cities becoming <coughs> places of sexuality. Now, what uh, is being argued in this chapter and throughout the rest of this book, <coughs> sorry, is that uh, uh, while this is happening, there is anxiety around the disturbing of a certain moral order that people were used to, right? Um, the standards and the expectations are being questioned and disrupted by these huge cities that are rising and all of these people moving into them and new social classes rising and you know people behaving in ways that they never did before in more rural areas that's at least the assumption or the stereotype right and so here uh the the chapter uses the work of this philosopher named michel foucault uh <clears throat> wrote in the 70s and in the 80s i'm sorry in the 60s and the 70s died in the 80s and one of his biggest contributions, right, was his philosophy of power knowledge as one kind of, uh, as, as two concepts that are connected, that are inherently connected. And we've been alluding to all of this, right? Knowledge, information, expertise, discourse creates power because we rely on meaning and information and expertise to mo navigate the world, right? And so power knowledge is changing the uh, kind of standard definition of power. It's not, I have strength and I have physical power. It's not there's a king or there's an authority figure that's just only going to threaten people and force people to do things, right? No, this is saying there are forms of knowledge that have to do with the creation of people. People and identities are created by the use of knowledge and information identities, subjectivities are being created. How are they being created? Well, this is where the video on Foucault and biopolitics comes into play, right? Foucault talks about this um, method or art to, uh, to governing, managing and ordering and organizing scales like a city through something called governmentality or kind of techniques of using power knowledge in different kinds of ways. One of these techniques is discipline. So what he's talking about here is that it's not just, you know, you're grounded and that's discipline. No, it's that we learn to develop habits and routines in different situations. And we repeat these things and they become common sense and we just do them, right? You go to school, you go to your locker, you, you know, you walk in line, you do different things, right? We are, we are being disciplined to become certain kinds of agents, certain kinds of people. And people are disciplined in different kinds of ways. And sometimes it does involve kind of punitive discipline, right? But it has to do with how you can use your body. And of course, this connects all the way back to what we've been talking about. Um, and, and this isn't to say that it's all bad, right? There's, that's, that's the open-endedness of it. Right? Foucault is challenging people to figure out and question whether many of the techniques that are used to organize and order a population are worth it or not. Okay, so that's discipline. Biopolitics has to do with the politics of the information that define and articulate our biologies. Okay, so we, you know, we're born and we die. We get sick and we're healthy. And there's all kinds of ways to evaluate these different things from, you know, modern medicine to counting mortality rates to the way that children are brought into this world, right? This is all about information about a population of people within a place, within a, a scale, oftentimes countries, but also cities. Um, and the way this information and this knowledge is used by experts who have been granted the authority to use this knowledge to shape us and to organize us in different kinds of ways, right? So subjects are created by participating in all of this, in these forms of knowledge and expertise. Subjects are created, there's a common sense. And for Foucault, this, this anxiety about the, the, the potential disruption of a moral, moral order in cities in the 18th and 19th century 
brought about discourses that he thought were very important uh, to kind of control and discipline uh, and, and manage cities, right? And this was a hysterical woman, masturbating child, the reproductive couple, and the pervert. So, of course, the hysterical woman had to do with women knowing their place and the, the idea that if, you know, a woman, like, didn't want to get married or was single or was, you know, getting into trouble, whatever, they would lose their mind and go hysterical and be taken over by their emotions, right? That's the discourse <clears throat> of the hysterical woman. Of course, there's a discourse of, of children being, you know, pure and never having any kind of understanding of their own bodies or their sexuality and the idea of shame being used behind this, shaming people uh, in different, scaring people in different kinds of ways to see sexuality as a threat, as something to be ashamed of. <clears throat> the reproductive couple, right, we key to heteronormativity, right, the purpose of being in love or having a couple is to reproduce, is to be in a monogamous relationship, and of course, anybody that falls outside of the norm being a threat and being a perverted person. So these discourses, of course, work to enforce or reinforce a certain kind of subjectivity and certain kinds of places that, um, you know, arrange our bodies in different kinds of ways and give us signals about who we are in different kinds of ways. So finally, circling back, uh, queering the city, similar to the concept of queerness, is about resisting all of this, of course, and um, creating different kinds of spaces in different kinds of ways. Everything from a neighborhood that is more inclusive to challenging what heterosexuality means, right? Saying that, wait, heterosexuality is not what we think it is. There is no simple, stable concept, even of a heterosexual. Um, things are a lot more complicated than we think. And so queering the city means applying that into space within the scale of the city itself in different uh, kinds of ways. And we've seen this from the Pride Parade to women's rights to safety uh, for women in, in cities uh, and to creating spaces that are, you know, protective and only for LGBTQ people. Different kinds of ways to kind of disrupt, that people have found to disrupt a certain kind of order that are that is viewed as uh, hostile, oppressive, and not helpful or productive. And again, this is open-ended and for us to think about and decide. So all of this together gives us kind of an introduction to how we're thinking about these issues and these problems. <clears throat> if you have any questions, of course, please post in the question section in the discussion board um, or any comments as well. Uh, anything that stood out, anything you didn't understand, please let me know or post in it. And uh, I will see you all or engage with you all throughout the week. Uh, I think there may be some people that have not introduced themselves yet, so please make sure everybody has introduced themselves. Um, and uh, we'll expect new lecture 